you do one of several things. One of the things that I like to do is to demonstrate to me an idea without touching it, but just the idea is that first off, the one is to stun, such as like slap, such as if I came up and slapped you in the face. Okay, this gives me an opportunity to run away. Some of this you've already heard because some of you have been coming to my class, we understand that. Some of you may have not picked up the whole thing. But the idea of the slap and the stun is it gives you an opportunity to run away, to escape, to get away from your, your opponent, the person that's attacking you. The second thing that you want to do, or the second level, you might put it that way, is to incapacitate. In other words, to take the arm out, the leg out, or some part of the body so that momentarily they can't use it. They're shaking their arm or they're in severe pain in their arm or their elbow or their wrist or their leg or whatever it may be or even their face where they got punched in the face in a nerve center and they're, they're shaking their head because it hurts and they can't, therefore they cannot fight. So within that one second, Kusho, okay, you've automatically taken control of the situation and you're able to fight and they're in your territory, you're no longer theirs. The third one is what I call TKO and TKO has several, several layers to it, technical knockout. The first layer being that they're stunned, their motor capacity starts to be, uh, their functions start to be wavered, they start to, to move a little bit like this, they're, they're, or their eyes are blinking, their eyes become bloodshot, their face becomes red, they become uh, slightly dizzy, incapacitated in some way, and are just not able to defend themselves as well as they think they can. Oftentimes when you're talking to these people, as you've seen some of them, when you say, are you all right, they go, yes, I'm fine. Okay, but on the other hand, by looking at them, you see that they're like, uh, 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 they're shaking their heads and, you know, nothing's going well for them, but they're, you know, they're, they're technical knockout. And in fact, remember, even a lot of real fights you'll see in boxing or, or in kickboxing uh, or KI, those type of things where you see the guy, they'll throw the towel in because the guy's still standing on his feet, but he's no longer able to defend himself. The second part of TKO is basically someone who's been knocked down, okay, but he's still conscious. So it's the same thing, it's just his motor skills have even gone more yet, and he's down on the ground laying or sitting, and he's still conscious, but incapable of defending himself. The fourth level is a full knockout, neurological shutdown. Shut down the body system, the person's knocked out for a period of time. In Kusho, that will usually last up to about 20 minutes if you don't revive them. In the process of reviving them, uh, Enough, you won't see any physical harm or body harm of any kind, and they'll be basically all right, except for, again, their eyes will be red. A lot of times, the blood pressure will be elevated. You'll see that in their face. They'll be flushed. Uh, either, they'll be either completely red, or on the other hand, they'll be completely white, totally restored. And the fourth, and the fifth and final one is, of course, death. And that's, we're not trying to achieve any of that, but rather what we're really trying to achieve is the fact that you do the least amount of damage in the shortest amount of time and so that you not only, number one, eliminate the attack. Number two, eliminate the lawyers. Okay? The judge, the, the lawyers and the criminal systems, those that like to make money where he comes up to rob me, and because I defended myself, now the one that attacked me and tried to steal my wallet wants to sue me because he supposedly got in. When you use Kusha, what's going to happen is this man is going to be laying on the ground. You're going to get down the street with your wallet, okay? And when he gets up, he can go to any lawyer, any judge, or anyone else, take all the pictures he wants, and unless his wife beats him up, there isn't going to be a mark on him. Because we're not attacking the skeleton system. We're not attacking the muscular system. We're attacking the neurological system and or the vascular system, the veins and the arteries. So that's what we're basically attacking. So that gives you an idea of what Kusho is in that sense, all right? And with Kusho, you can either touch an area, rub an area, or you can strike an area. Now, one of the things that becomes important about Kusho, especially for you black belt, but for anybody, is that you want to get to a point of your precision being very, very delicate in the sense that you want to get your targeted area very close, exactly where you want to be, so that when you touch somebody, it's a very light touch. I mean, it's obvious that if I sit here and I draw back as far as I can and I put all my weight into this and I punch him in the face and he falls.
falls down and you, you can't call that Cusho, okay? You can call that anything you want. Sloppy, but the fact that just because it gets knocked out does not mean that in fact that that's Cusho. So when you touch somebody, it should be relatively light. And if you can touch somebody like this and he's unconscious or staggering on his feet, now you've understood that you've got the right area at the right time and the right technique. With Kusho, what becomes critical about this is that there aren't any zero, none, target areas, pressure points, where you can directly attack them straight in. Almost every single one of them, without exception, has an angle to it. 45 this way, 45 up, 45 this way, to the right, to the left, or whatever, but there's just almost none that go directly straight towards an individual. So it's not just good enough to know the pressure points in the nerve centers in the vascular area and then end up hitting somebody straight on and all you've done is create a bruise because now you went to the skeleton system or the muscular system. And that's not what we want. Since I am not a physician, and I'm not going to sit here and talk about sternal uh, uh, mastoid clause. Yeah, there, I just messed it up exactly what I knew I would do if I was trying to talk. And I was just talking to a maxillary surgeon last Saturday. And in the process of talking to him in the tournament, he's asking me, what vein is that, what artery is that, what, what nerve is this, what nerve is that? And I kept saying, no, I'm not a doctor, I don't discuss that. Okay, finally I did say sternoclastoid muscle. Okay, and I said it, and I said, the reason I don't talk about it is because if I talk about it, if I have a doctor there, if I have a doctor there, then what happens is, if I make a mistake and I say, well, there's the corded artery, and there's the jugular vein, and here's the, the venous uh, nerve, okay, now I've mentioned those, and they're all in the same area, but I didn't point to where they're at. If I got them wrong, if I got the jugular vein, if I say the jugular vein on one side, and the croided artery is on this side, and the venous nerve is down here, and I got it mixed up from one side to the other side, then the doctor thinks I don't know what I'm talking about. And he's probably right, okay, because I'm not an MD. But if I tell you where the pressure points are at, the nerve centers are at, as I'm talking about them, then you don't have to worry about it and memorize, oh, this is the venous nerve, or this is the jugular vein, or this is the choroided artery or this is the occipital lobe, or this is the optical nerve. You don't have to remember all that. All right, so that becomes important. Having said all that, after talking to him a short while, the doctor, and I didn't know he was a doctor, because he said to me, he, I said, if there's a doctor in the audience, I said, then what he'll do is I said, he could be making fun of me. And he said to me, I would never do that, and I didn't get it. It didn't register what he was telling me, that he was a doctor. So in the process of that, after talking to him a while, he went and got somebody else, then he got somebody else, and I started demonstrating who showed. And the longer I went, this then went on in probably close to 15 minutes, and then we got other people who was doing it, and probably before the day was up, I spent 45 minutes to an hour with this gentleman from State College, and I'm assuming he's a maxillary surgeon, okay, being the jaw and the face. He may be a plastic surgeon because he does reconstructive surgery of the entire facial system. And the whole idea of it is, he says, you really know what you're talking about. And now the guy's going to bring me up to State College to do clinic. So here I am talking to somebody that knows the internal workings of the facial system, and the neck, and the arteries, and the veins. And not only is I'm explaining it to him, he's convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that what I'm telling him is so right that he wants to bring me up. So you have a whole lot to learn by this. The only thing I'm not going to do is tell you what it is. You can go to the American Medical School Association, their website, and download uh, the pictures there if you want to get some of where the veins are at, where some of the arteries are at, where some of the, the nerves are at. You can do that. You can also listen to what I'm about to tell you very, very carefully. Okay? You can also get a download from a website or get a book and then burn the book. All right? On acupuncture, shiatsu. They will give you the meridians and the nerve lines. That is a demonic activity. And being a Christian, okay, they talk about yin and yang, good and bad, dwelling within the same person. And I'm not going to go into that right now. I'm here to teach a Kusho today, all right? But you can at least get the pictures of it, put them in a copy machine, copy the meridians and the nerve centers. And in that sense, they're correct. 
Everything else about that is so demonically influenced that I don't want you to even do anything with it. You can get the pictures or download them off of a website and then burn the book. Don't keep it. Don't keep it around. Burn it. Okay? You don't bring the devil in your house and then expect to just leave it there in the corner and he's not going to occupy it. All right? So that's my recommendation. Now, for me, like, I'll download them off of a, off a website. I just went to a website yesterday, a Kusho website, and the guy's talking about astral body. It's supposed to be right here. And the astral body is one that projects itself out of the body, and anyhow, this is all demonic, and this guy's really into this stuff. Having said that, I'm going to back up here a little bit. If you travel around, most people do not know what Kusho is. They have no concept about nerve centers, pressure points. How's it feel to be right out here in the middle? Just, you know, I mean, you are it, fella. Everybody else back up, spread out. It's kind of making you a little bit nervous. I mean, you're the guy. You're the man of the hour. You know what I mean? But if you travel around and you talk to people, one of the reasons why people probably didn't show up here as many today as we would have liked, one is the location. But I was hoping to get people from Elmire and so on and so forth where they don't have a whole lot that they can do around this place. Okay, or the people from Knoxville. But one of the things why people don't come to Kusho's is plenty. At first, is because they have no idea what it is. Now, I, can, I went through, I don't know how many people on Saturday and Sunday. And the first thing they will tell you is, yes, I know what Kusho is, I know what pressure points is, I know what DMOC is, what DMOC is commonly called the death cut. And as you're talking to these people, in a very short amount of time, you know that they know as much about Kusho and pressure points as what I know about knitting and sewing and being a woman. Okay? Nothing. Zero. But the main philosophy of people in general is tournaments. We've come to a society where our standard by which we judge ourselves is a tournament. If I win in a tournament, if I get a if I get a belt because, and a lot of instructors will do that, if I, get a, if I win in a tournament, my instructor promotes me. If, my, if I come to a tournament and I win, I know my katas are right because I won a tournament. Okay? I had a school one time that was winning consistently with their katas, and the katas were wrong. And I was telling them they were wrong. I ought to know they're my katas. Okay? But because they were winning, they were absolutely positively sure that they were correct. I have an instructor here today that I think won a trophy. And he opened the lid, he made a mistake on his on his uh, on his cot. So the tournament is not the standard that you use to prove whether something is right or wrong. It just simply means that you have five judges up there that don't have the foggiest idea of what you're doing, and you buffalo them, and they're just lost in space. And now you've got third place, second place, first place, and now you want to say, yes, I'm absolutely right. So they have no idea what the show is. And when you try to explain it to them, they still don't get it. I know what a nerve center is. Let me tell you what the show is. It's really, really important. In martial arts, if you've been involved in it at all, for any length of time, and I've been in almost 50 years, but if you've been in it for any length of time, one of the things that they talk about is the secret techniques of martial arts. And you can travel around the United States from north to south, to east to west. You can travel around the Orient, and nobody seems to know what these secret techniques are. Just don't have a foggiest idea. Well, we, uh, uh, well, uh, we think it's the bunkai of the kata. In other words, the practical application. But we're just not sure exactly what it is. The secret techniques are the one second attack that puts the man down, incapacitates him, or knocks him out instantly, and you win the fight. Because a fight can't go on for a long time. See, we have a young girl over here, we have a young man over here, and we have another young gentleman right here. And the problem of it is, is when I'm your age, that's fine. I can jump up and down. I can throw a thousand kicks a day. I can throw a thousand punches a day. I can run five miles and I feel great. When you start getting my age, you better have something that's going to work and it's going to work very quickly. Though I work out every day, I still don't have the same kind of energy as she does or he does or even what he does. So I got to bring the fight down to where I can use it and win instantly. 
And if you're a woman, since I'm bigger than stronger than you, then you want to win even more because you cannot wait for me to get the advantage of you because of my strength. So Kusho is going to provide that, and they are the secret technique. So when I'm talking to most, when I say most, I'm talking about probably 99.95 to 98% of all martial artists in the entire United States have never seen a Kusho demonstration, have no idea what it is, have no idea how to make it work, and they cannot apply it. Now, I've said this only not to put somebody down, but you would think that, see, I don't want to change. We have Shotokan over here. We have Matsubayashi Shuranru here. We have Shorinji Ru over here. And when you have these different styles, I don't want to change your style, but simply make it better for you. Same as I want to take this young lady, and I want to take this young lady, and I want to make her technique better. I don't want to change her from being a female. I don't want to change him from being a male. I don't want to change him from being Shotokan style. What I want to do is I want to make his style better than what he presently has it. And that's what Kusho does by the practical application. The Tozu took martial arts karate into the high school as they were being occupied by the Japanese. And in the process of doing that, he took out what was known as the deadly techniques, the secret techniques. He took out the so-called secret techniques, but when you take something into the high school, what do you have to put up with? Teachers, school officials. Board of Directors, County Commissioners, Mom and Pop, Aunts and Uncles, Grandmothers, and every other person in the whole wide world that has an opinion, whether it's of any value or not. Because now you have little Junior in the school. So for him to take martial arts karate in there, he had to say, now this is a good way of exercising, and you can fight and defend yourself, but you're not really going to hurt anybody. Gishin Furukoshi, an Okinawa, does the same thing. He travels over to Japan in 1905-1907. Forgive me about the year. I'm not exactly sure. But in the process, he goes over there. Japan uh, occupies Okinawa. Japan is the arch enemy of Okinawa. They now call themselves J Japanese, but they are not in their heart. If you talk to a ja an Okinawan, he will tell you emphatically he is not Japanese. He never was. He never will be. They're a different race, a different country, and they only accept what they have to, but they are not Japanese. They are rival enemies, the same as the Japanese and the Koreans are rival enemies. So Gishin Fonokoshi goes over to Japan. He goes to the school, and in the process of going to the school, he does the same thing. He goes into the high school, and he takes martial arts karate in there, and when he goes in there, he says, wait a minute, this is good exercise. He gets with Gishin. King, uh, Jiro Kano, the founder of Judo, they start coming up with the belt system, and in the course of the belt system, they also come up with different routines of what they have to do to make this the way. You ever hear of karate do? Do means way. Way to what? Anybody have an idea? Well, let me tell you what do means. It means the way to spiritual enlightenment. So for those of you that consider yourself to be Christian, it's the way to spiritual enlightenment through Shintoism, Taoism, Buddhism, some other way, any way but through Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, Lord of Lord and King of Kings. So it's, it was their way of introducing you into the demonic forces over there in Japan, of which there were many, and it was a way to keep people organized and centralized systematically so that they would all do the same thing, they all wore the same belt, all do, everything would be exactly the same. Now the only difference was, is because he's teaching his enemies, he said, okay, these short stances for fighting that you never saw, we're not going to do those short stances. We're going to do the long stances like this. But not only that, we're going to sit out here and we're going to move them out here like this. So that you open up every one of the nerve centers down the entire leg plus the groin. Makes sense. If you're my devout enemy, what I'm going to do is I'm going to teach you exactly what you want to know so that I can hurt you whenever I want to. 
So that's exactly what the Ching Funakoshi did in Japan, and they ate it up. And it worked. And they win, and they go to tournaments, and they win. And the tournament is the standard by which they go to prove that they're right. Koreans, the same thing. Long stances, high kicks up here. I never saw anybody seven foot eight, other than on television. I couldn't kick them up there if I had to anyhow. Six foot eight's about as high as I can kick. But not only that, then the insult on top of injury, if you see the Koreans, they wear a red belt for brown. Why? Because eighth, ninth, and tenth black belts in Okinawa and in Japan wear red belts. So since Koreans and Japanese are devout enemies, they wear a red belt, a brown belt, to insult the Japanese and to insult the Okinawans, and the people don't even realize why they're wearing it. So every single time you see a Korean, he's innocent because he only knows what his instructor's been teaching him. I'm talking about American-style Taekwondo, Tung Sudo, one of those. Uh, so when, they, when you go to a tournament and you see a person wearing a red belt, what you're actually seeing is a direct insult against me or against any Japanese or any Okinawan. So I want to give you a little bit of the history of what's going on, why these things occur, and, and what was going on. So having said all that, Let's start off with the nerve centers. And I'm going to start, and we're going to break this down into two parts. Basically three, to count the, the middle part. The middle part is going to be where you're going to, we're going to turn off the cameras, and you're going to have the opportunity to practice these so that you can feel where they're at, how they work, how you can apply them, so on and so forth. Not everything in Kusho do I spend all the time showing you how to get to something, but rather to show you where it's at, what angle to attack it, and how to work with it, okay? So the first thing is I'm going to show you the arm. The second thing then is going to be the break, and we'll go back and forth on that. Then the third, the, the sec, third thing that I'll be showing is the more dangerous techniques. Okay, so we'll have two levels. The very beginning, and we'll say the, the upper middle class of techniques. And some of these you've seen, and some of them you have not seen. So the first one I want to show you, since you're right out here and volunteered, the first one that I want to show you is on the outside of the arm. Okay, you can see where the wrist bone is at. You might want to zoom in on this so you can see a little bit. It's on the outside of the arm, right here, approximately one inch up from the wrist bone. See this bone right here, the major bone right here? So it's approximately one inch up here. Now some of these you're going to know by accident, some of them you're going to somebody else show it to you, but the fact of it is it's, it's right here. Now this particular one needs to be, it can be pushed, it can be rubbed, it can be struck, okay? But in the process, it's not the bone that you're striking, it's underneath the bone, up towards the bone, so that you get this effect right in here. Or you can take it in here, make it this. And when you do this, then you take your bone, okay, and you can strike it, and what it does is it bends the wrist and opens the arm. Okay. Now this is not a knockout technique, it's simply showing you one of the points in case somebody would grab you so that you make it like this. Okay, I just come here, and you cannot keep this wrist bent or straight. Okay, no matter how really tight it is. And every time I do that, his hand will open up. It's kind of hard to catch it on camera, but his hand will open up and his wrist bend. So that's point one. Right there, one inch. Just find yourself right now. Find that bone, the major bone right here of your wrist. Then on the outside, then go up one inch. And when we stop the cameras and we start to work, then I'm going to draw around with everyone and make sure. Point number two, same thing on the opposite side. Now, the only time I'm going, I want to say this, the only time, you maybe want to even move that camera the next time down here. The only time that I'm going to tell you like liver 10 or stomach 9 or gallbladder 20 or something like that, because I don't have anything at all to do with uh, shiatsu, I don't have anything to do at all with acupuncture. I don't have anything to do with the meridian and so on and so forth, all those demonic activities. But for the very purpose of the ones that we're going to use the most, so that I can give you an idea of where it's at, so that you can kind of memorize it, that I may tell you and say that particular name or that particular number so that you can fit into it. In general, I think you're intelligent enough to be able to figure out if I say one inch above this wrist 
could have went up here, went to, so on and so forth. I really don't care about that as long as you learn. The second one is going to be if you find the risk going right here, then one inch from that is a spot, again, right underneath the arm, going towards the bone itself. Grab. Now this is one that if you push, you only get a certain amount of effect on. Okay? If I hold it, that helps, and you can see his face. Okay? But this one really, really likes to be rubbed. Okay? All I have to see, it really likes to be rubbed on this. And the more you rub it, you see his face, how red it is. Okay? That's how, by the way, you slap these. Okay? And that's how you relieve the pain from these. Okay? But this is a rubbing technique. This, is a, this comes from here, and it rubs from this point in the arm towards me. This is important. I said angles are important. Okay? So as he grabs and I try to rub this way, he only has a certain amount of pain and he still has hold. If I come this way, he let go of me, and now the bandage opens up. And that's exactly what you want to see. Okay? So you've got point one and point two. Going up the arm, part way up, about two inches up the arm. We have point three. Again, it's exactly the same thing right here as this one here. Just right up, and if you had a tight grip, all I do is I come here like this, and I hit it, and his arm bends, and his hands open up. The fourth one that I'm going to show you for right now is right where this muscle comes down and attaches onto the bone. Okay? Right underneath there again right by the, the bone itself, and you see this point, so this was number two, this is number four, and it's about two inches up from there. You can rub it, you can strike it, you can hit it, you can do whatever. Then we have, so we have one and two, three and four, and then in here we have three, but it's just enough for you to know right now that if you go here, and his hand, look at his hand. Okay. If I push, close your hand. As I push, his hand wants to open up because of the pain. Right? It's nothing else more if he has his hand, make his hand tight. If I rub it like this, then the hand opens up and he can't keep his hand closed. So that's just another way if he grabs you or is choking you, if you can get in here, you can loosen his hand. Now, it's not something you want to stand there and hold him because he's going to punch you. The idea is I want to get him off me, so I go like this. Okay, now I'm free. One second. Crucial. One second and your techniques work. Okay? So we have one and two, three and four. Alright? So let's stop for a moment. Let's do some of those and then we'll go for the rest of them. So you want to fade that out? Okay? So one inch above, one inch above this one, two inches up.
two, three, and four. And now we're going to get in here on top of the arm right here. We're going to go one is right in the middle, right between the two muscles. Okay? So again, that is a strike point, and it has to be struck down at a 45 degree angle towards me. So that you want to get this effect right here. If he opens his hand, okay, and he, or he has a hole on you, okay, that you want to get this effect right here. And his hand opens up. Okay? Now you can hit out here or you can hit out of here. These are all nerve centers. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven for right now. Turning the hand over, okay, you have one here, you have one in the middle again, and you have one. Move the arm up like that. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, turn it over. Eight, nine, and ten. All right. So let's work on those ten. First off, locate. All right. These are striking techniques. From here up, from where the, the muscle comes down and attaches to the bone. Okay. They're striking techniques. Struck in towards you. These down here can be rubbed or touched. These can be pushed depending on, but you don't get the same effect. You could rub it, but again, you're not going to get, because you're not probably going to rub off or fall off. So you're much better to come at a, at a striking angle, a knife hand, or knuckles like this, whack, okay? Or whack here, or here, okay? Or one knuckle strike here like this. Right here. Okay. That's what's known as incapacitating the arm. Slap it. Then rub. Okay. All right. Find those. Get your partner. All right. Other words, here you are. You're a freshman, ninth grade. After 20 years of martial arts, you're a freshman in high school. That's what your boom kai is. You may be able to kick better than me, you may be able to punch better than me, you may be able to dance around better than me, you may be able to jump in the air better than me, but the whole point that you're missing is you've lost the true sense, the secret technique of martial arts, and Kusho is actually what it's all about. 1966 is when I knocked out my first person. George Jones started teaching this in 1983, all right, when Oyata taught him, because Oyata was an old man and, and also, well, I think he thought he was going to make some money off the board. Let's face it, people like to do something for a month. So in 1983, George started teaching this. In 1966, I knocked out my first man I did not revive him. You will stay out 20 minutes on a Kusho neurological shutdown. And when you get up, you're in worse shape than what you were when you went back. Okay. That's kind of scary. I wish I hadn't done it because it's an accident. All right, so let's go back. Let's start now using some grabs, arm grabs, shoulder grabs, chokes, lapel grabs, these type of grabs. Start finding the situation and working with it, okay? Now, 
like, then you want to do this one. Okay. And it's right between the two. These are struck at a 45 degree angle down and in. Okay, you see that? So this one here would be struck at this point like that. Same thing on the opposite side, same area. One, two, three. Down and in. 45 degree angle down and in towards me. Now I'm not a sweeping motion, but just down and in. Then up towards the elbow, we went here on the outside of the arm, on the top of the arm right there, and on the inside. Like I said they're reciprocal. In other words, what's on one side is on the other side. What's also on the front is also pointed on the back. We're not going to get into that today. Here by the elbow, here. Now if you can see, you can get around here so you can see without blocking the camera. Because now these are some new ones. Right at the elbow joint itself. Okay. Feel that one? And okay. Okay. Yeah. And right in the elbow crease itself. And right here. Bang. Okay. And again, these can be struck. They can be hit one knuckle, two knuckle, fifth, whatever. All right. Then we're going to move up the arm. This is called the Goji Tendon Receptor. This is the elbow itself. This is how you find this one. Put your hand right flat palm of your hand right directly at his elbow. Just like that. Okay, let me have the other one. For the sake of the camera. So I put my hand right here in the flat of his elbow. This is how you find it. This is not how you use it out on the street. This is how you find it. Then I take my hand and I roll it like this, so I have these knuckles sticking up. Then I just roll off and there's a very small indentation right off of the elbow. Right in there. Now here's what it doesn't do. If I go like this, there's only a certain amount of pain. It is a rough point, and the rough point must be back and forth towards me. Okay? Right there like that. Now at this point, you can take the man down, you can hold him at that point. If he goes to get up, all I do is rub a little bit. Don't do that. No, no, no. Okay? And then... Okay. So that's called the Golgi Tendon Receptor. It does not go back and forth. This way really hurts, doesn't it? What? Oh, okay, I didn't put the question. So we have here, here, and here. We have here, how do we find it? Palm of the hand, here, okay? Since we only got about 25 more minutes, we're gonna end the arm here. This one, where the, bicep, where the tricep triangulates right here, makes this little V, okay? Right there where it be. Now here's where everybody makes a mistake. They come in here and they whack with the forearm like this. Does it work? Yes. 20 pounds of pressure to break this. Try Whack! Okay? Does he hurt? Definitely. But the problem is I may have broke my own arm. So what I do is I take the back of my arm like this, and it's a strike point. Did you feel that? Okay. Maybe I'll turn the other way too. See, when you're here. Get that right there. The other one is we'll have one right on here on the bicep and one on there. Okay? And watch his little face. <laughs> if I push him and I can strike these. And there's another one right here. Now this is a dangerous point. Listen to me now. This one between the bicep and the tricep is a dangerous point. Look at his face without me even doing hardly any pressure. Okay? This one can really do a lot of damage to somebody, and the more you stretch it out, the more painful it becomes, the more dangerous it becomes. So I can, the, the choke that he had earlier, yeah, the choke, if I took this right here and I did this, like that, okay, then I can have him basically unconscious in a matter of seconds, and he won't be able to use his arm plus his other potential problem. So that's right there, between, so you can fit into it, okay, just like that. Okay, and that'll get you into a lot of other things. Okay, real quickly now, the new ones, right there at the middle, those three, okay, then on the back of the elbow, palm of the hand, roll the hand, take these knuckles, okay, go to tendon receptor, must rub up and down, side to side doesn't do anything.
and then inside the arm right here, and the bicep itself. Okay. If you get a hit off of here, such as like he's throwing a punch and you come over here, and you see he can't do that. In fact, we do do that as an exercise. As he's throwing hook punches, like, I come in here, there, right there, now his arm is, is that's exactly what I mean by incapacitating. Okay? Now he's got about, I got about two to three minutes before he can really punch me hard with that arm. That arm I still have to worry about, but now he's in pain and out. And I touched him lightly. If I hold, ah! and hit the arm like this, he's unconscious. You just have to take my word for it. Don't do that today. Okay. You right?
done for the rest of the day. So you can use this for your own family. All right. So if the lung shuts down, one or both lungs shuts down, then you want to strike between, and you can see if you just push in your own arm, okay, right between the two muscles, about four fingers down from the elbow. Right at that point, right between the muscle, you'll see the muscle split. It might be hard to see it right here, but right there, you can strike that area, then massage it and rub it. Okay, spasms the diaphragm, as I said earlier, and then the person starts to breathe again. That's for a lung fix. The other one is a neurological shutdown. In other words, I hit him in some way, incapacitate him, he's out. If you will, sit down, please. Get some of my black belts over here. First thing you want to do is cross his legs, cross his arms, okay? In the process of doing this, you also want to support his chin because I said we have a neurological shutdown. He's unconscious, okay? So you want to support his head and his chin, and I also want to put my knee on his spine like this, all right? So that I'm supporting his back. So we have him like this. On the back of his neck, turn around to the camera, not on the spine, not in the hollow of the neck, but on his two muscles right here, is the spinal accessory nerve. Whoops, I said it wrong, didn't I? I wasn't supposed to say that. Okay, there, there is a nervous system that runs right down here. Okay. What you want to do is strike those two muscles or those nerves. Now, how do we do that? If he was knocked out by a hit on this side, then we hit the opposite side. Same thing if we got hit over here, we want to strike this side over here. And again, we're not in the business of punishing somebody. I don't want to sit here and beat on this guy's neck until he really lays down on the ground and can't ever get him up. But we're supporting his head and his chin like this. He's been knocked out from a hit over here. I take this and I slap it up at a 45 degree angle. I don't know if the camera's heard this. Okay, the idea of it is, it sends an electrical shock, stimulates him, and he wakes back up. And then you can massage the back of his neck. You can come right up the spine like this, one half inch off the spine. Okay? You can rub his head, and if, if, if his eyes don't open up, you can do it again. Right? But usually, within one to three strikes, he will be fully conscious. Not necessarily will he be coherent, not necessarily will he be totally able to function motor-wise and be able to get around, but the fact that he'll be conscious again. All right? Staying right there. So that's a neurological shutdown. We went from the lungs to the neurological. And the next one is the heart. So that's how serious we're talking about here, that the heart stops beating. Okay? Now, I would suggest that you go out on the street and find somebody that's laying on the sidewalk and go, well, let me try this. Okay? The paramedics and the doctors and the lawyers may have a field day with you. But if, on the other hand, you find somebody that the paramedics have pronounced dead, and you know it's from a heart attack, it could be your own relative, you might want to try something like this and see if they don't revive. Okay. If you take and you come down the back right here, it's kind of hard to see with a shirt on, and you find the scapula, that's the shoulder blade. Okay. Two fingers down from the shoulder blade all right, is this nerve right in here. And where it is, is that's what the ribs are for. The purpose of those is to protect the nerves. So it's actually between the nerves and the intercostal muscles over here. And so you actually want to pinch that nerve against that rib. Well, how are we going to do that? Well, first off, you can only work with the right hand on the right side. It does not work on the left side or with the left hand. It must be right to right. And it must come at a 45 degree angle from here over to his heart. Okay? I hope I didn't get my knees dirty on you. <laughs> Just joking. So we come here, two fingers down here, like this. One more thing. I'm going to strike from here to here, and I'm going to give just a little bit of twist. The twist is to pinch the nerve against the rib. But I'm sure if you get a good enough shot with you, you'll probably wake him up anyhow, unless he's totally, really, really dead. Okay. So that you want to get this effect here, and I just slide me down. All right? Okay. Now, I didn't say these didn't hurt. Okay. What I said is they're nervous systems that we're trying to revive somebody. 
stand up, please. So the first one we used was a lung. The second one we used was the accessory nerves running down the back of the muscle of the neck for a neurological shutdown. The third one was the finest scapula run right around there like this. You find it runs here like this. Two fingers down, about two inches in, okay. shooting from an angle like stand over here, shooting at an angle with the right hand from here, see his back is like this, and going right towards his heart with a slight turn. Now how you can know if you got the right angle for the slight turn, you can take the lid off a jar. Later on today, I'm going to show you how to knock somebody out with what they call the gallbladder cl uh, cluster. And what you want to do is a slight turn, like you're trying to take a lid off the jar.
same time and got a complete neurological shutdown. And in fact, that's exactly what would happen. Your body would start shutting itself down. So I thought I would use this board here to kind of give you an idea of where it's at. If we take this area right here like this, kind of like so. strike it. 
I'm not kicking at the groin. I'm actually kicking right in there, right into that nerve center. If I get it exactly right, I'm going to almost definitely have a neurological shutdown on him, if not death. That's how serious this is. That's why the first thing I started to show you was a revival technique. This man's going to shut down and he's going to shut down instantly like a ton of bricks. It's going to be just like a wash rag and went plop on the ground. The problem with this is because of the size of it, it might be a little bit difficult to find. But one thing nice about Kusho is you don't have to be exactly right. The more correct, the more precise, the more accurate you are, the more likely it will take a less path for him to go down. But on the other hand, if I'm a little off here, that's okay. I'll probably still TKO him, and I'm still able to get out of it. And I'm still able to wag my fingers at the lawyer. I didn't do anything. You're not getting any money. Okay? So there's your two. Now we're going to go to four before we look at those, and then we'll, we'll, we'll start to have a little break here and start to find it. Okay. The four... If you take the Adam's apple, there's two ways to find it. Sensei Mike. Yes, sir. He has a longer neck, so that's why I'm using him for you to see. There's two ways to find it, okay? One third of the way up the neck, right here, is called stomach 10. No particular reason I'm telling you that other than the fact that got used to use one third up again is stomach nine so that you have them right here the other way got a little ink on me here the other way to look at that is right directly across from the adam's apple okay is what's known as commonly known as stomach nine now one of the things you want to start to look at is what effect does the nerve center or the vascular system have on the body because it becomes important. Just Thursday night I was showing a few people, if I'm getting attacked by multiple people, I may need to get some people away from me, some people I need to get in on top of me, in the sense that I need them to fall down alongside me. If I don't do it correctly and I have him fall in on top of me and he blocks my road, then I can't defend myself against the person over here. Well, this is a prime example. Stomach nine can either be pushed down at an angle, okay, like this, or it can be pushed up at an angle like this. Now the best way to do it is to go up at an angle and it works best at somebody that in fact is taller than you. The last thing I want to do, the last thing I want to do is to work with her because I said stomach nine should go up at an angle like this and now I gotta get way down here, okay? to get this angle, and I don't want to do that. I got you red, and I didn't mean cut you. <laughs> okay. Stomach 9 and 10, they say, I'm again, okay, that this affects the blood pressure to the brain. Now, how you work this is you do not hit with this knuckle. You're hitting with, so you want to keep a rich hand, you want to hit with this knuckle right here, and this knuckle right here. Okay, so you want to keep your hand straight so that when you come in like this, you want to come in at this angle like so. So that you're coming in and down at a 45 degree angle. All right? You can practice this one, stomach nine. It's in or down, let's practice it up when we take the break. And how you can practice this without hurting each other is to simply lay your hand on top of it. All right? Just lay your hand right on top of there, and that, by the way, is not on that muscle. It's body cavity striking or nerve center striking because you have the jugular vein, you have the carotid artery, you have the vagus nerve, which passes in down here. And you push in and up like a rocket at a 45 degree angle. So that when you're here like this, you simply go like that. And already, as you can see, the cameras can see his eyes are bloodshot. Now, I didn't hit him. What I did is I pushed, okay? I went from here up at a 
multiplied to three eggs. Now, how you can do these is if you have a cow or you take the person, when we're practicing these, you're taking the leg of their knuckles, the back of their knuckles, right here on stomach nine and ten, so he opens his hand like this. And then you come in here and you hit like that. Now, you can't hurt him that way, but you see the effect that it has. Here, in and out. Right? Okay? So that when you're in here like this, and if you do both of these on the same time, not only is he out, but you're probably going to take him and maybe. Okay?